Hey everybody, welcome back. We are in another session of 2020 Vision. We are super excited to join us tonight. I'm, I'm super blessed, I'm humbled, I'm honored uh, that we get this platform, that we get to come into your house or your home uh, while you're at work, in your car, wherever you're listening or watching us online. I uh, just want to say thank you for uh, allowing us to do that. We are diving into another topic tonight. We're in a session, we're in a series of sessions that are going to be topical uh, over the next month or so. We're just going to, going to you know, tackle some topics that a lot of people have questions about. And so I want to give you the opportunity, if there's something you'd like for us to discuss, uh, go to our website, whitestonechurchtx.com, contact us, drop us uh, an email with questions or ideas you have. I uh, would be glad to, to, to tackle that. Um, and, uh, and we look forward to some new ideas coming into the future. But right now, we're fixing to tackle a really cool topic, and uh, that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is one of my favorite uh, uh, studies in the Bible. I, I love to talk about the Spirit of God, the presence of God, the power of God, the move of God, just the, the Spirit of God and the impact and the power of that he brings to each of our lives. And so we're going to dive in tonight. I want to invite you. Uh, we do have notes for each of our sessions. Again, if you need notes, we've uh, gone through the book of Revelation. We've gone through a study on hell. Uh, last time we did a study on is Jesus God. Um, so we're going to do two or three studies on the power of baptisms. And uh, I did say that plural, the power of baptisms. And specifically, we'll zero in uh, extensively on the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so if you want notes for our sessions, if you want to catch up on any sessions that you've missed, go to our website, Whitestone Church TX. You can find them there in our sermon uh, uh, section. Go to our, our YouTube channel, Whitestone Church TX, uh, on our YouTube channel. and uh, But go and, and give us your contact information. We'll email you our notes. Uh, we've got a really good list of people coming. I would encourage you, the one thing I ask, uh, and I don't do it enough, is if you would, go to our YouTube channel, Whitestone Church TX, and um, subscribe. We're trying to get 1,000 subscribers so that we can go live on YouTube simultaneously as Facebook. Uh, but you gotta have, on YouTube, you got to have 1,000 subscribers. So I think we're somewhere close to 700. We're close to getting there. But if you or your friends or family members, if you would go and subscribe and like us. Just subscribe to our page. We would greatly appreciate that. So grab your Bible. Grab your notes. Grab something to write with. Grab your, your, your I'm drinking hot tea tonight. Grab your coffee. Grab your water, whatever. And uh, let's pray and let's dive into the topic of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Father God, we're excited. We love you. And God, we bless you. And God, you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. You are Jehovah Rophe, the Lord God that healeth thee. You are Jehovah Nisi. Your banner over us is love. You are El Elyon, the most high God. So Father, we worship you. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would dwell with us. You would tabernacle with us. That Father, your word says where two or three are gathered, that you are in our midst. And so Father God, I pray that you would just start to, to permeate through our minds and our hearts and, and our flesh, God, that you would just get to the core of our being. Open up your word to us, God. Let us see the power of baptism. And so, God, let us open, just let us see what things we've never seen. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. So grab your Bible. I want to start with the chapter or the book of Hebrews in your New Testament, chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. And I'm going to throw out something that not too many of us in the church are very familiar with. But it's in your Bible. So I'm not making it up. I promise it's in your Bible. And that's the topic of baptisms. Not just baptism. Usually when we say the word baptism, it instantly sparks a thought in our mind. Somebody getting baptized as an infant. Somebody getting baptized as a teenager or an adult. Either being sprinkled with water or being dunked in water maybe in the ocean, maybe in a river, maybe in a swimming pool in a backyard, or more traditionally in the church, uh, in, a, in a tub, if you will, 
uh, or the priest or the father um, sprinkling an infant at, at baptism. So usually when we say the word baptism, it instantly gets us to think about water baptism. And that's absolutely great. That's absolutely correct. That's absolutely biblical. But I, I want to throw out what Hebrews chapter 6 says. I'd like for you to grab your Bible, read it for yourself. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And let's read it together. It says this, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles. Do you remember leaving elementary school, going to middle school, going to junior high? I do. I thought I was cool. Actually, I was pretty cool. I'm just joking. I just remember the day that I graduated, if you will, from Wooten Elementary uh, is, is one of the elementary schools. I went to Hyde Park Elementary. Uh, I, 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 I don't remember. I, I got moved around a lot. So, But we, uh, when I left elementary school, I said, I'm no longer a baby. I'm going to junior high. I'm going to middle school. My grandson, Coulter, just had his commitment commencement award ceremony online yesterday. So he is officially out of the fifth grade and now into the sixth grade. It's this cool thing. That's what... That's what the writer of Hebrews is telling us, leaving the discussions, leaving the topics of elementary school. Okay, now we're going to middle school math. Now we're going to middle school history. We're moving up in the world, if you will. Discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. Let us, let us keep advancing in our walk with God. Let us, let us not just get stuck with the basics, but let us grow. Let us get off of the milk and into the meat of God's word, uh, as my friend Todd would say. Going off of the milk, going into the meat of God. Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, verse 2, of the doctrine of baptisms, plural. Laying on a hand, resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment and this we will do if God permits this is what it's saying it's saying that there is the doctrine in scripture of baptisms so it's not just baptism singular it's the plural forms of baptism so you may be going well what what other baptisms are there um I I I, I don't know I mean is there any other baptism other than water Listen, water is the most popular and water is the most taught in Scripture. And it is extremely viable. It is extremely important. And it is a must in our walk with God. But in this study, I want to take us through a couple other baptisms that the Scripture talks about. <clears throat> We're going to outline three of them specifically. The baptism of water. The baptism of the blood of Jesus the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the baptism of fire. There's a couple other mentioned in Scripture, but these we're going to zero in on and really say, okay, God, what are you trying to tell us? Where are you trying to take us as believers? So let me just read a couple verses, and let's just hear what the Scripture says. The next one is Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And this is Jesus speaking. I, I love this. This is right before he ascends to heaven. Uh, he tells the disciples hang on, then, he, then he's going to come back on Pentecost, which is in a couple weeks, which is a big deal. May 31st, get ready for Pentecost Sunday. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he, meaning Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me, for truly John baptized with water. Who's John? John the Baptist, the the hairy guy eating locusts, you know, wearing camel's clothes, living in the desert. He called people to a baptism of repentance in the Jordan River. Jesus says, listen, listen to this. You've heard from me for, Ju for, for John truly baptized with water. But you, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And not many days from now, speaking prophetically of Pentecost. Listen, we just heard from the lips of Jesus himself that there's water baptism that John showed us. Jesus himself was baptized in water. We see 
the baptism of water, which is powerful. Jesus brings it up. But he says there's also this baptism of the Holy Spirit. So out of the lips of Jesus, we now see easily two baptisms. Water and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Mark chapter 1. I just want to clarify scripturally that there's more than one baptism. Mark chapter 1. John the Baptist says this. I baptize you with water, but he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let me make this point. Man baptizes with water. Your pastor, your loved one, they baptize you with water. When you get baptized in water, traditionally a follower of Christ, it doesn't have to be a pastor. That's, that's nowhere in Scripture. In fact, we're commanded by God to baptize people. Uh, it doesn't say, if you have a degree, baptize people. It doesn't say, if you've gone to seminary and if you are the head uh, pastor of the church. No, no. Great Commission, Jesus tells followers of Christ to baptize other people. So, so that's another topic for another day. But, but Jesus himself baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Mark chapter 1. Luke chapter 3 and Matthew chapter 3. Both say this, as for me, John the Baptist is speaking again, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he, Jesus, is coming after me more mighty than I, and I'm not even fit to unloose or take off his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and now we get a third one. This is the first time we've, he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John says, I have truly baptized with water. Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we just got introduced to a baptism of fire. Woo! Blowing my mind. What do you mean a baptism of fire? We'll search scripture. We'll figure it out. But now we've got three baptisms. We've clearly got three baptisms. Romans chapter 6. Listen to this. Verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Oh, preacher, I don't, I, I, what do you, listen, there's a baptism into Christ Jesus and a baptism into his death. Wow, this is another, okay. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. How were we buried with Christ? Remember, when Jesus is crucified on the cross, and he dies, he's buried for three days. Well, as believers, here's the baptism that I'm going to call the baptism of the blood. As believers, when we are, or as people, before we become followers of Christ, when we realize that we need to die to our old self, when we realize that, man, I'm living wrong, I'm full of sin, I'm full of greed, shame, lust, commitment, I'm full of guilt, I'm full of sorrow, I'm full of sad. I need a Savior. I Listen, when you get saved, you enter into the baptism of Jesus Christ. You are washed. See, here, here, I'll use a terminology that a lot of us church people have grew up on. You get washed in the blood. You get washed by the blood of the Lamb. Well, washed and water kind of have the same connotation. We're baptized into water. We get the concept where we're dunked under water. We come up, the old person dies, the new person rises. When we're washed in the lamb, in the blood of the lamb, we're technically baptized in the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus flow, it covers us like the water covers us. The blood of Jesus covers us from the top of our heads to the bottom of our feet. It doesn't just cover our physical body. In fact, it doesn't. It's not like we, we feel and see real blood. It's spiritually washing the sin away. Let me, let me try to say it like this. When many of us, before we came to Christ, we did things that we were ashamed of. And some of us would try to wash that away. We would maybe even take a shower to try to wash away that filth and that feeling. We may try to go, because we did bad things, we may try to, to, to do good things 
to wash away the bad things, to outweigh the bad things. You know, if we stole something, we may go try to give somebody something back and, and, and more to kind of give up. But we can't wash away something on the inside because we can't get that deep inside of ourselves. It takes the blood of Jesus. So this other baptism is the blood of Jesus. Let me read Romans 6 again. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus? We're baptized into his death. His death was on the cross. His death is where the blood of Jesus flowed. Therefore, we're buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Listen to this in Acts chapter 2 from verse 38. Peter said, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus. And the forgiveness of your sins, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter, again, is talking about the baptism of the water. He's talking about the baptism into Christ Jesus. And let me say like what Peter is saying in verse 238. A lot of people get wet in a tub. A lot of people may even go to church and get wet. They may go to a river and get wet. Thank you. They may go to uh, a place and just go through the religious function of getting wet. But baptism into Christ Jesus means you and I die to ourself. We die to our old self, our sin. We die to our, our self and our dreams, our wants, our hopes, our aspirations, our way. We die to ourself. That's the blood of the Lamb cleansing us. Then we're washed in the water, and then we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let's keep going. We'll make, we'll make sense of this. There's the baptism of the blood. Let me, let's start there. What does it mean to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ? Lots of you grew up in the church, and there's an old hymn talking about, Are you washed in the blood? of the lamb. I, I can't even sing it. I got it in my head, but it doesn't come out right. But, you know, I, I could see the, the guys in the choir as a kid. Are you washed? Are you washed? You know, and, and you know, at least that was, <laughs> it didn't really go down like that. Yeah, it probably did. I think they were doing this, but, but are you washed in the blood of the lamb? That's real churchy language, but yet it's biblical language. So let's look at Matthew 26, <coughs> 26. This is Jesus at the Last Supper with his, his best friends, his disciples. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and says, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood. So in communion, when we take the drink, the, the juice or the wine, whatever, whatever, it is that we're drinking in remembrance of Christ. We're drinking the blood, the blood of the new covenant. Jesus says, for this is the blood of the new covenant. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Which is shed for many for the remission of sins. There's no forgiveness of sins without the remission of blood. There has to be bloodshed for us to be forgiven of our sins. Hebrews 9 says, According to the law, almost all things are purified with the blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Christ's blood had to be shed for you and I to be saved. But if we walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all our sin. Listen, Revelation 1.5, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So the first baptism that we have to go through is the cleansing of our sin with the blood of Christ Jesus. Well, how do we do that? We simply repent 
and we say, Jesus, would you cleanse me from the inside? God, I got sin. Nothing can take. I've been to counseling. <clears throat> I've been to psychology, God. I've been taking pills. I tried to get drunk. I tried to do that. I tried to pay back and be a good person. I tried to create good karma for all the bad stuff I did. I've tried to outrun my past, God. It's been 30 years ago, but but my past still haunts me, God. I can't t seem to shake this feeling that I'm lost, I'm empty. Jesus says that's because you don't have the forgiveness of sin, the remission of sin. And the only way that you can get forgiven of your sin is to receive Jesus Christ into your heart. And the Bible says the blood that he shed on the cross washes away the inside man, the inside woman. It washes us clean. It flows over us like water, like a river, like a waterfall. It's just a constant flowing of the blood of Jesus. So the first baptism that we experience is experienced at the cross. Not in the tub, not in the lake, not in the river, not in the Holy Ghost. It is in, it's at the cross of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? The power of baptism of the blood gives us power. Write this down. It gives you power over sin. The blood of Jesus washes away all the power of filth and hurt and shame and death and abuse and, and, and violation. It washes us clean. It gives us power over sin that we committed and sin that was committed against us. Some of us, some, some people listening will say, I have such shame of an abuse that happened to me as a child or as a young person or, or in my past, most recently. And I tried to wash the filth away. And I'm telling you that God will wash away what water can't on the inward, inside man or woman by the blood of Jesus. Can I get an amen? So the first baptism that we experience is the washing away of our sin through repentance, through forgiveness. The second, the most popular is the baptism of water. So this baptism of water is, is something that Jesus instructed us to do. A, John the Baptist started this process. So let's look at baptism of water. Now, what I want to do first is see, is, is maybe just explain just a little bit about baptism by water. And we'll, we'll read some scriptures here in a minute to back it up, specifically out of Colossians. <clears throat> well, let's just start with Colossians. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sin and uncircumcised of your flesh, have been made alive together with Jesus, having forgiven you all of your sins, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities, powers, making a public, public, a public spectacle of them, triumph, triumph over, triumphing over them. The baptism of water is modern-day circumcision. Pastor, what are you talking about? Let's go backwards into the Old Testament. All through the Old Testament, we see when God made a covenant with Abraham. And God says, Abraham, listen, here's a covenant that I make with you. I'll be your God. You'll be my son. You'll be the father of many. I'm going to establish a covenant with you. You fulfill the covenant, and I'll fulfill my covenant. Now, we know Abraham couldn't do it. God fulfills both covenants. We, we're lost without God. We can't meet God halfway. We don't meet God halfway we meet God. We, we turn around. There God is. He meets us all the way. Can I get an amen? But the circumcision in the Old Testament, this is what would have to happen. Abraham, as a grown man, 
had to have the skin, uh, his foreskin, removed. It was, it was symbolic of his flesh. So the flesh that, was, uh, um, that he was to be circumcised from, that flesh represented his old self, his old nature. So in the Old Testament, if you wanted to become a follower of God, a follower of Yahweh, you had to obey the Ten Commandments. You had to obey the law. You had to honor the Sabbath. You had to honor God. You had to keep the Ten Commandments, keep the commandments of God. But then as no matter what age you were, you had to be physically circumcised. That circumcision was symbolic that your flesh had been sacrificed to God, that your flesh had been removed. The excess flesh from you, the flesh that causes sin, had been removed by God. Modern day baptism is the picture of Old Testament circumcision. So we would say this, that water baptism is the circumcising of your flesh. It is the destruction, it is the removing, it's the cutting away of that which is unholy before God. So when we see circumcision in the Old Testament, we see the equivalent of water baptism in the New Testament. See, let's, let's read this. Um, we see, okay, let me bring up a couple of other examples of Old Testament baptism. The flood. Noah's flood. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3. When the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight people, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just as Noah and his family were saved through water, just as the filth of the world was washed away with water, baptism separates you from your old self. Water separates you from your old life. It is literally the supernatural severing of the old you. When Noah got off the boat, he got off on a new ground a ground that had been washed away. The filth of the old earth had been destroyed. Noah gets out. He's still on the earth, but the destruction, the filth had been removed. When God saves you by his blood, then he takes you into water baptism to remove you from your old self. Let's look at another example. Um, the, another example would be the Israelites coming out of Egypt. The Israelites were slaves to Pharaoh for over 400 years. They're building pyramids. They're slaves. They're dogs of the earth. God delivers them through Moses. Moses takes them out of Egypt. Now, Egypt in your Bible always represents sin, the world, slavery, and your old self, that which kept you in bondage. When the Israelites leave Egypt, they walk through the desert to the Red Sea. And God, what does he do there miraculously? He parts the Red Sea and safely brings his people through on dry ground. Then Pharaoh and his armies that are trying to kill the Jews, kill the Israelites, follow and the water destroys and swallows them up and drowns them. That is a picture of what God does. He brings us out of Egypt by his blood. He brings us out of slavery, out of addiction, out of bondage, out of our past. And he brings us to this place where we pass through the water. We go through baptism. And in the water, our enemy of our past, that which enslaved us from our past, is drowned. See, this is good news. God says, listen, in water baptism, the old you dies. And the new you is risen to life in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says it best. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Romans 6 says, Do you not know that as many of you that were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. And just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. When Jesus was buried for three days, he went down. When you go under the water, you go down. You die. Not physically. We don't hold you under the water until you physically quit breathing. But you die in the spiritual realm of sin. You've already been forgiven through the blood. But the water is what washes you clean in the flesh. And that, separ that separates you from your old lifestyle. See, when it says that we are new creations in Christ, the world says things like, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you are in Christ, you're a new creation. The old you is dead and gone. It's not even you that lives anymore but Christ that lives through you. So now you have victory over that which used to keep you in Egypt, that which used to keep you in slavery, that which used to keep you in bondage, that which used to push you down. God says, when you got washed by the blood of Jesus, I forgave you for all, all, the, all the crazy stuff of your past. But when you went through the baptism water, you got severed from that past. That past is in the graveyard. What we don't like about funerals, what we don't like about cemeteries, is that we don't want to hang out there because they're dead. Now, we miss them, we love them, but we know that our loved ones that are in the ground, they're not there anymore. We know that the spirit of that person is gone. But the reason we don't want to hang out in dead places is because it brings us down. It, it reminds us of, listen, God says this. If you're, if you're a saved believer in Jesus Christ, don't go dig up the old man, the old woman in the, in the graveyard. Don't put those grave clothes back on. Those things were washed in the water. That, that life was forgiven by the blood, but, but that process of water baptism is severing the old you from the new you. Can I get an amen? I hope I'm explaining this well. But baptism in water is the severing of you from your past. Here's a problem that a lot of people experience. We get saved. And, and listen, when I say we get saved, we get washed in the blood. But then, <clears throat> depend upon you know, your church and depend upon... Then we sometimes say, well, you know, I'll get baptized someday. You know, I was baptized as a baby. I've already been baptized. Well, you know, one day I'll get her. I don't really want everybody to watch me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm overweight. Uh, I'm too old for that. I, I don't fit in my swimsuit anymore. You know, I don't, I don't want everybody watching me. I don't want to make a big show of it. I just, listen, baptism in water is not an option. There's too many people who have bought the deception and the lie of the enemy that, hey, just the, just the cross is good enough for God. Well, we're going to read some scripture. Jesus got baptized. Yeah. If Jesus got baptized, then you don't have to. It's not really necessary. Now, let me clarify. I'm not saying that just because you get in water, you're saved. I'm saying that after you are washed in the blood, after you are forgiven of your sin, it's now time to be obedient to the one that forgave you and go be baptized. Well, Pastor, I was baptized as a baby. Man, I, I'm so excited that your mom and dad committed you to the Lord I'm very thankful that they took you to the church and they honored God with their newborn baby. I'm so thankful that your, your parents or your grandparents or your godparents or whoever took you as a baby, I'm, I'm so thankful that your parents or, or your, um, uh, whoever, your guardians, 
that they respected and loved God enough to dedicate you to the Lord. But that baptism as a baby doesn't save you. That wasn't your choice. That was somebody else choosing for you. You don't want your parents to choose who you marry. You don't want your parents to choose your job. You didn't want your parents to choose which college you went to. There's a lot of things that we don't want people to choose for us. <coughs> Somebody else cannot choose for you to be saved or not saved. Now, I grasp the concept. I understand the different denominational streams of, of practice. And I'm not here to debate that tonight. But I, hear, I am here to say this. If you were baptized before you asked Jesus into your heart to wash you with his blood and you repented of your sins, then that baptism wasn't for you. That was for somebody else. You are now responsible to say, you know what? I gave my heart to Jesus. I choose to go be baptized now. Baptism is not a religious function. It is a devotion to God. It's almost the equivalent of a young man who sees a good-looking girl and in his heart, he falls in love with her. And in his heart, he dreams of marrying her. And in his heart, he confesses his love to her. And in his heart, he grunts to her and he plans a special meal. He buys the ring that he can probably can't afford. He, he does it right and he says, Would you marry me? And he offers his love to this young lady. And she says, yes. And they kiss and they embrace and they say, we love you. And, and then she says, when do you want to get married? When's the date? Ah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we don't really have to follow through with nothing. I already told you I love you. I don't, just listen, I really don't want to stand in front of a lot of people and wear a suit that I can't really fit into anymore. You know, I don't really want to, stand in front of a lot of people and make a big deal about our commitment. I, you know, we don't really, nah, I just want you to marry me. And I just, I just express my love to you, but I don't ever really want to have a wedding. I don't ever really want to have a, a specific date. I mean, can't we just put that off for three or four years and work this? See, no lady in her right mind would go for that and say, oh, that's acceptable. Okay. no, Jesus says, listen, if you love me, now follow through and let me wash you clean. See, it goes so much deeper. The husband's role is to wash the wife with the word of God. He's to baptize his wife with words that God speaks. Sometimes husbands baptize their wives in words of, 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 uh, of uh, put downs and, and disgust and and you know we call our spouses bad names and we sometimes we baptize people with words but look it up for yourself it's another topic another study for another day Ephesians 5 says husbands wash your wives with the word of God baptize them with what God says so this baptism of water is vital to the walk of Christ there's too many believers who have not been washed in the water because they've chalked it up to just a public confession of their faith. Listen, baptism is a public confession of your faith, but oh my God, it's so much deeper than that. It is the severing. It's the circumcision of the heart. It is the severing of your old life. It's the thing that you get to look back on and say, you know what? I buried my drug addiction. Yep, 14 years ago, I buried. Now listen, I've struggled since then. I fell off the wagon, but I but I went back to the graveyard and dug up an old man or an old woman. Listen, I died to that in the water of belief of Christ Jesus. I died. He forgave me at the cross. He, he forgave me for what I have done, what I, what I will do. He forgave me at the cross, but the old me died in that water. So I don't care when or where or how you get baptized. I'm not here to convince you that it needs to be in the church and you need to you need to have at least three inches under the water because because god forbid you got two little hairs on your head that stick up and a lot of people have said well they didn't their whole head didn't go under the water so they're not really bad listen 
I don't think God really cares how you get wet. But I do believe God cares that you be baptized, that you get wet, symbolizing and allowing him to wash and to sever your flesh. This second baptism, the first is the baptism at the cross with the blood of Jesus. Don't miss the walk from the cross to the water. Listen, a lot of scribes and Pharisees were too religious. They were too proud to go get in a dirty river with the ugly, hairy, bug, bug breath guy named John. And be baptized for the repentance and the remission of their sin. Salvation and water baptism go hand in hand. Now listen, a lot of people say, well, Cameron, Pastor, what about that thief on the cross? Okay? I didn't say that it was um, qualification for entrance into heaven or not. Jesus looks to the thief on the cross and he says, Today you'll be with me in paradise. The thief didn't say, hey, time out, Romans. I've got to jump down and run to the river real quick. Otherwise, whatever Jesus just said is invalid. No, no, no. I'm not saying Jesus doesn't have. I'm not saying that this is a legalistic pattern. But I am saying that the thief on the cross missed a blessing. He missed an anointing. I promise you that he meant it. And if he had been able to, he would have ran to that water. Too many of us are able, but we don't run. Now, I'll just throw out just this one idea on the thief on the cross. Because I, I know this is a big denominational line. It's a, it's, a, it's a controversy, and I don't care about all that stuff. I, I really could care less. But I do, I, this hit me one day when I was studying this. And, and I can't, I've looked for it biblically. I can't find it. Um, so I'm not saying thus saith the Lord, but, but I do want to just throw this out about the thief on the cross. If you remember the, the scene, this is the crucifixion of Jesus. And the Bible says about the sixth hour, Jesus cries out. And if I'm correct, that was around, <coughs> I, I want to say mid-afternoon, early to mid-afternoon. And Jesus does die before the two thieves on the cross physically because they come to break his legs they realize he's he's already dead they pierce his side where blood and water flow but then they break the legs of the thieves so that they'll die before sundown before like nightfall but here's just an idea i just want to throw this out at you about water baptism and the thief on the cross um most of us have seen the passion of the christ the movie mel gibson put out several years ago about the crucifixion and the life and the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in that movie, uh, it's as if the, the well, let me, let me just say, in the movie, like a teardrop falls from heaven and, and it's like God crying and it just you know hits Jesus when, when he breathes his last breath. But biblically, the Bible does say the clouds grew dark and it, and it, and an intense darkness filled the land, and an earthquake shook, and the temple veil was torn in two, and old prophets rise from the dead and are walking through the streets. The Bible, your Bible says all that. I think that there may have been some heavenly rain that poured during that event. So wouldn't it be cool if the thief on the cross did get baptized, but he got baptized by rain from God? I don't know. I just think it's cool. But let me throw this out at you. Baptism is not an option not an option you may get the pass you may get a pass if you're a thief on the cross but it's not an option i've done baptisms in very unique ways again i don't care how you get wet just get wet by your own choice can i get an amen um romans 2 says circumcision is of the heart comes by the spirit water baptism is your choice as a follower of christ after being washed in the blood, not someone else's choice for you at birth. Water baptism in and of itself does not save you. Water baptism in and of itself does not save you. It is a response to being forgiven at the cross of Jesus Christ. It's a response. 
And it's power when God cleanses you and severs your flesh. It's power when you get circumcised in the Spirit. Israelites leave the desert through the Jordan River. When we cross the Jordan, let me let me throw this other thing at you. And I know uh, I'm, I'm spending my time here. We're going to pick up in session two where, where we leave off tonight. But uh, I, I want to go slow on this. So listen to this. When the Israelites left Egypt, they go through the Red Sea. We've already talked about that. God swallows up their enemy. He kills their past in the water. And then they get into the desert and they make another mistake. They're saved, if you will. And they make another mistake. And God, God, now their punishment is they gotta, they don't trust God. They don't trust Moses. They send 12 spies in the promised land. They did so they gotta wander the desert for 40 years. <clears throat> After the wandering, they cross through the water again, this time the Jordan River. Now again, it's symbolizing, it's a type or a shadow of baptism. And I've prayed to the Lord about this, and, and this is just, I'm just throwing out some ideas because I just want you to, I just want to stretch you. Again, this idea, just like the water on the thief or rain at the crucifixion, uh, could be just Cameron's imagination. But I think I do have a pretty decent argument in it. When the Israelites left the desert and they went through the Jordan, um, there's an old spiritual hymn, you know, uh, um, swing low, sweet cherry, uh, coming forth to carry me home. And it, it's talking about I'm going to cross over from this life. I'm crossing the Jordan into the promised land. Listen, at creation, well, let, let me say, before I say this, the Israelites were going into the promised land and they went through water again. They were being sanctified. They were being washed as they entered into their promised land. We'll get to baptism of fire, but when we die, the Bible says that we'll cross over that Jordan. We'll cross over into that promised land called heaven. And scripturally, the firmament above the earth is made out of water. So wouldn't it be cool if we go through water with our angel taking us into heaven? I'm just throwing it out there. That's how my brain thinks. But I think there's some legitimate uh, scriptural basis there. Uh, Noah's flood, again, is God baptizing the world and eradicating the filth of the land. Let me just recap on these first two. Blood baptism is being washed clean, forgiven, and reborn. Jesus tells Nicodemus, birth, flesh, bir flesh births flesh, spirit births spirit. Water baptism is the separation from your past. If it, Listen, if you're saved and you've never been water baptized, then you're not truly separated from your past in the flesh. And that may be why you can't get that breakthrough. There's a lot of people that pray to God to do, make a move in his life, he's like, man, just, you need to follow what I've already told you to do. I can't take you to level two until you finish level one. These principles, these, these elementary principles. Separation from your past. The old is dead. Raised in the newness of life through Christ Jesus. It's no longer I that live, but Christ Jesus lives within me. That is water baptism. The third baptism that we're going to talk about in this Bible study in depth, I, I have to recap and, and, and talk through these first two, is spirit baptism. So write that down. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual baptism. I want to take us to 1 John chapter 5. And between now and our next session, I really want you to read this passage of Scripture. Um, when we talk about spirit baptism, we talk about Holy Spirit baptism. Again, we get a lot of mental pictures. When we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, some of us grew up in churches or denominational streams that did not practice or teach on the Holy Spirit. It, we talked about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, but we didn't talk a lot about the Holy Spirit. 
we didn't use terminology like baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, filled with the Spirit. We, we didn't use words like that. We just talked about the Spirit of God in a, in a pretty uh, sterile way. Not too serious, not, not too, you know, not, not too in-depth. Some of us watching grew up in uh, what we would just call charismatic or Pentecostal, Pentecostal streams where everything was about the Holy Spirit. And, and we have these mental pictures when we hear the Holy Spirit. So when we talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want to throw this out at you first. Have you ever had a preconceived idea of a person that changed when you actually met them? Have you ever had a preconceived opinion, idea, or assessment of a person? For example, you may watch Pastor So-and-So on television and have a preconceived idea or opinion of that person. Your favorite rock star or favorite actress or actor or favorite athlete or favorite politician, you may have a preconceived idea that changes drastically when you actually meet them. For example, um, you may have wanted to meet a really famous person and you envision them signing autographs and asking you what, 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 What's the what's my favorite song? You know what what's what what movie did I play in that you love the most? And you just kind of mentally play this this dialogue to 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 have that opinion shattered when you meet them and they're rude and they don't sign your autograph and they they don't care if you like their songs they don't ask you and they and they just blow you off and you're like oh that's not how they act on TV that's not my preconceived opinion. Some of us have preconceived opinions and ideas of the Holy Spirit that were shaped and formed by our upbringing, whether that was our religious denomination or how we saw someone else interpret what the Bible says. So some of us grew up on this, this uh, part of the paradigm where the Holy Spirit was really downplayed and frowned upon because we saw this other paradigm, the other end of the, the spectrum, where uh, if you don't shake, rattle, and roll and, and fly around the room enough, then, then you, you know, the Holy Spirit is, is exemplified over here in this way. There's almost, and I'm, I'm really trying to say this carefully, there's almost a blessing for those that didn't grow up in church and didn't have any idea because when they meet the Holy Spirit, they have no preconceived opinion. So some people, when they think of the Holy Spirit, they say, well, the Holy Spirit has to act like it did when I grew up in this church. Other people say, well, the Holy Spirit can't act like it, 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 it can't act any different than it did when, than the church that, that I grew up in. And so we have these preconceived ideas. So as we meet the Holy Spirit through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, let's not be afraid of a couple things. And I'm trying to build some foundation in this first session. The first session, the points I really want you to take away is that there are multiple baptisms in Scripture. And we don't usually call being washed in the blood of Jesus a baptism, but that's what it is. It's the baptism of of the, of the forgiveness of our sin. It's the washing away of the inward man. There's the baptism of water. But then Jesus says, I baptize with the Holy Spirit. John says, one's coming after me who baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire. I'm telling you, whether you grew up understanding it, whether this is foreign to you, or you go, oh yeah, I know all about it. I'm telling you, there is a washing of the Holy Spirit. There is a Niagara Fall waterfall that is so powerful, so tumultuous, so engulfing, that if you get under it, it will take you to a place that you cannot, would not, 
and could not and you you could and would not go on your own. There are things in the Christian walk that can only be produced by the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we get this power? We've got to be washed in the Spirit of God. We're going to pick up on that in our next session. But I want to read this passage to you. And we'll dig into this passage over some time, over the next couple sessions. But this is 1 John chapter 5, verse 6. <coughs> John here is talking about Jesus. And John says, this is he who came by water and blood. Jesus came by water via the birth canal. He came by blood via the blood of God, the bloodline of Christ. Jesus Christ. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. That water and blood also means baptism and blood on the cross. Not only by water, but by blood and water. Not only by water. He didn't just come physically. He didn't just get baptized as a good religious function. But he came by the blood line of God, the Messiah's bloodline. And he shed his blood on the cross. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Who bears the witness of what Jesus did and say? The Spirit of God. When you hear about Jesus, the Spirit of God confirms it or denies it. The Spirit of God is what reveals to you what Scripture says. The Spirit of God reveals to you who Jesus is. Verse 7. For there are three. Now here, here's where we're going. This is, this is where I'm the meat of what I'm trying to get to. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. So what John does is he says, Hey, listen, I'm talking to you and I here on this planet Earth, but there are three who bear witness in heaven. What's it mean to bear witness? Testify in court. Somebody to testify. If you're a witness in court, and you testify, I was at 7-Eleven, I saw that guy run into the store with that gun and run out with that bag of money. I testify that what I saw is accurate. Testify. There's three in heaven that bear witness. They testify witness. The Father, mark this down in your Bible, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Well, who is that? Father, Jesus, the Word, Spirit. Father, Son, Spirit. Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. We learned this in our, in our last session about Jesus is God. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. These three testify the exact same thing. So this is where it gets deep, but this gets good. So please stay with me on this. There's three in heaven. Father, Son, Spirit. And they all agree. They never disagree. It's never a two to one vote it's never a, a oh it, they they are one they can never be separate okay but they all three are testifying and it says this and there are three that bear witness on earth the spirit notice the reversal of order the spirit the water and the blood what is the spirit the water and the blood it's talking about these three types of baptism. Now, this passage on the surface is talking about Jesus. But it's also talking about us witnessing and, and testifying with God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son, through the Spirit, the water, and the blood. For example, or let me just read these points. Water is the natural birth of Jesus. But it's also the baptism of Jesus. Blood is the supernatural bloodline of Jesus and the blood that was shed on the cross. The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus at baptism. Supernatural, a supernatural God meets physical men. The Holy Spirit bears witness of the ministry of, his, uh, of Jesus and his ministry. 
to, um, so the three that bear witness are the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and they're one. The Father, here, here's my point, the Father testifies with us when we're washed in the blood of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he sent his Son. When you get washed in the blood, when you get forgiven for your sins, when you're baptized in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Father testifies and goes, yep, I saw Johnny. 14 years ago, he came to the cross. He came to my son, and he and the father testifies. Yep, that's where I met him. Then the next one is Jesus, the word. Jesus testifies with us when we're baptized in the water as he was. Jesus goes, yeah, then I saw Johnny get separated from his sin, was separated from his past in the baptism of water. So the father says, yes. I, I testify that he went to the cross. Jesus says, yes, I testify that he went to the water. Then the third one is the Holy Spirit testifies when we're baptized in the Spirit. And we'll get to that next time because the baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't this one-time event. It's not just, oh, I got baptized in the Spirit 14 years ago. Listen, that's when the Spirit of God says, oh, I testify with Johnny too. He walks with me. He listens to me. He he walks with me day by day. Listen, there's three in heaven that are testifying. And there's three on earth that testify. The three on heaven are the Father, Son, and the Spirit. On earth, it's the Father. I'm sorry. On, on earth, it's the Spirit, water, and the blood. Listen, I know we're going deep in this session. But I want you to stay with me. Session two will be Tuesday night at 6.30. We'll be back for session two. And we'll dig into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We had to lay some foundation tonight to understand that there's multiple baptisms. We have to understand that, that there's power in each of them. And as Christians, as Christ followers, if we just experience one or two or three, or if we don't experience them all, we're not maturing the way God intends us to mature. And we're losing power. We don't have the breakthroughs. We don't have the, the power of God in our life. So thank you so much for being with me. Listen, as always, if you accept Jesus Christ in your heart as your Lord and Savior, and you are water baptized, and you follow Christ, you fall in love with Him, the Bible says He'll save you. He'll take you to heaven. You'll be with Him forever. And that's a good thing. God bless you. Thank you so much. Let me pray for us. Father, we bless you and we praise you. I bless those that, that are listening to this. God, anything that's discombobulated, God, would you bring it in order? Would you just bring it, our minds and our hearts, in order with your word? And God, help us to see the power and help us not to stop in the progression of our walk with you. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, see you again next time, Tuesday night, 6.30, session two power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Bye.